Welcome to our uh, workshop that we titled Towards the Mobilization and Integration of Historical Biodiversity Observations. Uh, I want to start by introducing myself. So I'm Leticia Navarro. I'm a researcher at the Doniana Biological uh, Station, ebdc um, based in Seville, Spain. And I'm co-organizing uh, this workshop with uh, a, a lot of other people whose name are here. Uh, most of them, unfortunately, could not be uh, in this room today, but I'm lucky uh, to have the company of Adam Spitzig that I will invite to introduce himself. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Spitzig. Um, I am a wetland ecologist, uh, worked in wetland conservation across uh, North America for most of my career, uh, Ducks Unlimited. Um, I went back to school recently. I'm doing a master's program uh, at Harvard University and, and actually more wetland. Uh, conservation policy, biodiversity conservation policy. Um, but I've become very interested in historical long-term um, uh, biodiversity monitoring, um, hence my involvement in this particular project. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your, your all's thoughts today. Thanks, Adam. So um, I actually already gave a talk on this topic in one of the sessions tomorrow, but I figured it wouldn't hurt uh, to, to give a shortened version uh, for those that uh, could not attend the, the session. Um, and so the, the premise of the talk I gave is the fact that um, a lot of the detection and attribution of biodiversity change and a lot of the decision making that is made uh, currently is based on relatively uh, short time series. So you've seen since yesterday a lot of uh, graphs showing how biodiversity has been changing and typically those start in the 1970s. And one important thing is that I'm, I'm not criticizing those work by any mean, um, but they do the best they can with the best data that is available at the moment. And so I wanted to ask the question of what would happen if we used uh, older data, so more historical data. And uh, what really got me interested uh, in these topics was this, this publication that came out uh, in 2015. And so what they, what they did here is that they looked uh, at the situation in Europe of the, the European eel. Uh, you can see here its current distribution that is constrained to the coast of the Iberian Peninsula. This is a critically endangered species. It had massive, massive uh, crash in its stocks since the 1980s. And the way conservation is done for this species at the moment in Europe, um, or at least at the time of the publication uh, uh, of this paper, was uh, by setting targets to recover uh, population sizes. But the problem is we didn't have uh, data on the size of the stocks historically. So instead what they did uh, here is that they uh, mined information from a historic um, geographical dictionary, sorry, um, published in Spain this time in the in the mid 19th century, and what you could see on the on the map in the center are locations in Spain where the eel was uh, identified in those uh, documents. So geographical dictionaries basically is that people go to localities and they ask questions uh, on on the on the locality, on the people living there, but also on the species uh, that, you, that you can find, species that are being cultivated, hunted, fished, etc. So it's a really interesting mine of information for us. So having this information, they were able to reconstruct the historical uh, range of the European eel. And having this information, they can now uh, propose conservation measures that are uh, based on real historical data, and this time, considering the restoration of the range of the species by, for instance, removing dams, rather than restoring stocks based on value that we don't, don't even have. And so the use of uh, uh, historical data uh, and its potential is not really new. Some more than 20 years ago, this publication came out where uh, they looked at, they used historical data to show that there were time lags uh, between overfishing and the collapse of coastal ecosystems. Um, you can use historical data also to, to point in time when species were introduced. Um, this is also a very interesting topic in my opinion because by using short time frame for conservation, we, we risk uh, placing an unfair burden uh, on countries in the global south. Um, and historical data have also been used uh, for, for topics related to, to social justice. So we wanted to unveil a bit uh, the potential of historical uh, data using historical ecology, which is the study of past patterns, events, and processes to understand present-day ecosystems 
their composition uh, and describe their long-term trends. And we believe that this provides the scope and the methods for the identification, the mobilization, the integration of historical ecological data. And so back in, in March, we organized a workshop uh, in Seville in Spain, bring together historians, geographers, landscape ecologists, conservation biologists, anthropologists, community ecologists, uh, lots of different disciplines. And the first thing that we spent quite a lot of time on was to identify um, what could be sources of historical ecological data. And so we classified them in different uh, broader categories of sources, such as anthropological, narrative, archival sources, such as the geographical dictionaries that I showed you earlier, uh, technical sources, think of cookbooks, for instance, that have been used, like historical cookbooks, to see uh, which species were used uh, uh, in the past and are no longer used now, uh, artwork, uh, spatial sources, such as um, uh, historical maps, for instance, but also scientific collections and paleo archives. So you can see some of those sources are natural and others are uh, cultural. And so we ask, what is the temporal coverage and av availability of those data? What information can be mined? And whether this can be done directly or indirectly? And so we're, we're still in the process of, of uh, working on all this, but uh, you can see on the on the left-hand side, uh, how, what is the temporal coverage, basically, of these sources of information? So going back to the mid-Holocene, so 6,000 years ago to now, um, and you can see that overall there, there is a pretty good uh, coverage, particularly between 375 years ago, and we're also identifying to which extent we can extract information uh, at the species level or ecosystem level or information on, on the use that is made of the land or of species and their intensity, um, either directly with dark circles or indirectly uh, with gray circles. So again, this is work in progress, but you see that there, there is a, a, a richness of information that can be mined uh, from the sources over a, a pretty large period of time. Um, but of course, there are many challenges and bottlenecks. So this is a citation uh, that I find quite telling uh, by Edwards uh, that said, chipped, cracked, and fogged, laced with errors, omissions, prejudice, silent assumptions, and preconceptions. Historical texts do not reflect the past so much as they're refracted. So we identified several challenges. The first one is the discoverability, because discovering, uh, discoverability sorry, and quality of the information will depend on the, the motivations and the expertise of the authors, but also of the editors of uh, written material. There's a taxonomic challenge. It's not easy to identify uh, species and sometimes taxa from historical sources. And there's also a problem, uh, spatial challenges, because some methods cannot be used everywhere. Uh, some sources are not globally available. And even when you know the location, these are historical names sometimes, so it's a bit difficult to confirm where the location is today. And so on top of that, then the question is, how do we efficiently mine, mobilize, and integrate all this data? So uh, we worked on a roadmap, which, as I pointed out this morning, at this point is more of a wish list on, uh, for the, the mobilization of historical data. Um, so one thing that came up a lot that the, the participant of the workshop brought is that data, whether archives or slides or maps, should be properly digitized, uh, georeferenced or referenced and vectorized. Um, that historians and archivists should consider biodiversity when they digitize information. Uh, that there should be centralized search infrastructure for historical databases, and of course that machine learning is leveraged, and that the fair care and OCAP principle uh, for, for data are respected. And all of this, of course, supported by interdisciplinarity and, and, and actually more transdisciplinarity in that case. When it comes to the historical data integration, you can imagine that this is uh, pretty challenging because we have very sparse uh, data, but there are a lot of people that have already uh, thought about how to integrate um, different kind of uh, data sets, so I'm hoping that we can build on that. And so that brings us um, to the point of today's workshop. So we passed the so-called brief introduction uh, that I just did. And we wanted to address uh, basically three things with you. The first one is uh, considering 
biodiversity observation networks or bonds and historical data. So can we, uh, with you here, identify, well, discuss the identification and mobilization of uh, historical data sets? So we're thinking of allocating about 45 minutes to that. And then moving on to the next step, which is going from historical data towards uh, essential biodiversity variables or EBVs, um, what do you think would be appropriate approaches to integrate all this different kind of data? So that would be another 45 minutes, and then discussing uh, what the next steps could be. Um, so I'm just going to pause here in case there's some questions on what I already showed. Going once, twice, no, no question. Okay, so that was crystal clear. Um, and so for the first part, uh, we, we broke it down into uh, more, uh, to clearer question. So for the identification and mobilization of data, our questions to you are, first, do you know of historical data sets that can be used to detect biodiversity change? Um, and if so, how are those data sets structured? Which standards are applied? And importantly, are they publicly available um, in repositories or in databases and so on? So I've uh, put here um, a tiny URL to a, a, a Google spreadsheet. Um, that we can put on the on the screen. Uh, we just put a, a few examples uh, to show you the kind of information we'd like to discuss with you. So um, let's go to the yeah okay. So data sources we have uh, five examples here: the Archive of Saint Gallen, uh, the Madoz Geographical Dictionary uh, from the 19th century, the Relaciones Topográficas from the 16th century. Um, data that was extracted from paintings uh, in Europe and the Kyoto cherry tree flowering date. And um, so for each of those, we say which is the data type, um, which is the geographical extent and scope, temporal extent and scope, which biodiversity information can be extracted, and uh, what would be the reference if it's published, if it's standardized, and where it is accessible. So if you want to... I'm going to open my laptop and I can put this information for you or you can just do it uh, as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to open the floor to your input. Hopefully you have plenty of that. Yes. Yeah. So we focused on uh, the mid Holocene to say um, pre-digital uh, data. So 6,000 to let's say, yeah, late, uh, late 20th century. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to pass you a microphone. Wait. Yeah. Cuz I couldn't hear half of it. Oh, there's one there. Hold on. Thank you. It's not working. No. Hello. Oh. Um, uh, just looking at it from, uh, I guess, a, a biodiversity user's standpoint, um, historically, um, fur trading was very, it was very important in Canada, and it still is in certain, certain areas. Um, I was wondering if there's historical data on either, you know, fishing or fur trading and counts that were, might have been available that are on a public database. Yeah. So, do you want to answer? Did you want to answer? Or? Um, just a remark. I mean, Um, but just the category at this, at this stage is really useful. So that's helpful. And uh, just a little follow-up one as well, toponyms, you know, in language and, you know, how people name certain areas, name of a river, name of a lake. If something's called Pike Lake and there's no longer a pike in that lake, we could have, might have assumed that there might have been at one point. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, are you going to take these down? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I'll let you invite them. Yes, one. please. Uh, 
um, chronology record is 1,200 years of data on the Sakura cherry blossoms in Japan because they were recording it. But there's also been a very interesting study, which I think was led by ZSL in China, on the distribution of gibbons, and they were using old drawings. And when the artistic depictions started having tails, etc., it showed that they'd never had first-hand experience of the gibbons, which is why they were becoming less and less like the animals themselves. I don't know if that kind of approach has been deployed elsewhere, but for animals widely depicted in art, that kind of approach can be useful because then it's the artistic license is growing relative to the actual knowledge. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. We do have, as uh, Leticia pointed out, uh, methodologies being developed by particular researchers to kind of tease out the reliability of artwork in particular. Um, uh, but that's a fascinating potential source. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, maybe just addition to the list that you have, another good reference would be the Biodiversity Heritage Library of the Smithsonian. They have a lot of archives of monographs that you can revisit for the distribution of species. And then another thing is like, I started with taxonomy and systematics, so I use a lot of monographs for historical data. Mm -hmm. And then I shifted to the use of ancient DNA, specifically in paleolimnology, we do a lot of sediment coring in reconstructing lake history, and now we're using DNA as proxy to reconstruct presence or absence of species in lakes, also in marine ecosystems. So we can go as far as like a thousand years ago. So I think that's another emerging technology that could be helpful in this field. Yeah, amazing. I, I want to talk to you later. I, I would um, emphasize, maybe we could put up the tiny URL one more time so people can pull up the, the spreadsheet. Oh on their computers because it might be easier um, for individuals to just type in specific uh, sources. Um, but we, we love the comments and we want to keep having the conversation, but just so everyone can participate in, um, you know, at the same time. Yeah, can Please. you, can you I, I, I don't know if they can see me in the back. Do you mind putting the slide that we had before with the tiny URL? And type away, don't, don't be shy. Really any level, yeah. any, any idea is, is welcome. Please. Is this the biggest library of this sort that you all know of? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's alongside GBIF, so, yeah. Yes. Um, a couple of thoughts about this. There was a mention of fur trading, and I can say that there are, there's, there are old notebooks and records and documents that you can find on the web, and there's just there's not a specific place, which is why I don't really have anything I can put into your table, but I've seen them, and so you can go through these old documents, and I have a few examples of them on my computer, but you can go through, and um, there's records of this, and then for Canada, there's a lot of records where you had a lot of people going up doing their, you know, exploring slash colonizing of <laughs> the north, but they were recording things as they saw them, so there's a lot of these old um, and it's not like there's a database you can go to, but you can search and find a lot of these old records. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I'll say, because so we did a lot of this trying to find whatever data we could for the Arctic um, for freshwaters. And as part of this, I spent the time for Canada to try to look through. And it's very scattered for Canada. Um, but you can find a lot of old records and you can find old fishing things and all of these. Um, but a lot of the information is in the indigenous 
records. And that is where you have to be very careful. And I know you had up there fair and care and everything, but it, it, you have to be very careful with, with this, respectful of this information, because this information belongs to the people. And so you have to be careful that you're not just going and taking it and using it. And so we, for example, did um, a systematic literature review of existing indigenous knowledge just to say it's out there, it's, there's information, we can think about how we can work together with indigenous peoples to say things about freshwater bio biodiversity. But you know, we were explicitly told, don't put any valuation on it. Don't you know, be careful of how you use it because that's not respectful to us if you're using our information that way. So just a caution that there's gonna be so much information and valuable information, but you have to really approach it in a way where you're working together with indigenous communities to make sure you're not exploiting the information. Thank you. I'd, I'd actually be really interested to have some references to the work you're talking about, to, to have it as a, as a point of reference. Yeah, thank you. In, in Bogota, uh, we have an, an interest and funny experience. It's not like a data set extract or anything, but I think uh, it has potential if, if, well, if you know it. And it was an activity with the National Museum of Bogota and, um, it w and Humboldt Institute. And it was about birding in the museum. So it was about finding uh, birds in the paintings. And, and it, this is our paintings for historical paintings. And it was with citizens. It was with people like, uh, that liked the museum and stuff. Uh, but I think there is a lot of potential in extracting information through some kind of citizen science, <laughs> but uh, historical citizen science. So, um, uh, and this workshop for me is also uh, like a good idea to bring there for this kind of events. And maybe if there is like a conclusion about the, 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 the structure of, of this kind of data, uh, these exercises could be enhanced to produce data for the analysis. Thank you, that's great. Yeah. Can I ask you a follow-up question? So on this example from Bogota, is the, the, the data, the information that was generated, is it um, findable somewhere in a, in a standardized form? Yeah, I'm not sure if if the, they collect the data uh, exactly, but I can ask uh, the people that make the exercise. Yes. Okay. So one of the questions we'll ask you at towards the end is how do you want to follow up with this? But on the this um, on this shared table, there's a tab where you're welcome to add your uh, your contacts. So yeah, and I realize we should I put. We should have put hours too, so you can reach out to us. But yeah, please do do add your contacts so we can come back with questions. Yeah. Mm, no. Or? Yes. yes. OK. Um, yes. Well. I guess I want to say thank you first for the workshop because uh, I think the historical part you're talking about is what got me interested to go in ecology. Um, and I guess what I want to share with you is uh, one of my uh, thesis during my PhD was gathering information or historical information on submerged aquatic vegetation in lakes, which are, I guess you can uh, see them as a seagrass of lakes. And so basically I just did a, a search on Web of Science and find a bunch of paper where they um, had this uh, temporal information on, on, uh, on these plants. And you know, a lot, a lot of these are paleo records where they compare um, um, the actual core data with um, information from the historical record, and they do that like for one lake because it's it's a lot of work. And then there's also these data um, from uh, like botanists that went around lakes and 
uh, collected the species information, and some I was more interested by uh, abundance information. Um, but yeah, so anyway, if that paper is of interest, there's a, a collection of studies where you have this information. So it's not, so it's basically a, me a metadata. It's not actually the, the data. Uh, maybe one day it's going to be something I'm going to do as a professor or if I have a keen student, but yeah. I, I think there's also the same thing for seagrasses. Okay. No, that, that's, that's perfect. It's actually, so we, we have some idea, some good idea after this workshop of the kind of, of data that's out there, the typology of data, but all those specific data sets is super uh, interesting for us. So we can, we can see how the data can be organized, mobilized, and so on. And, I wanted to follow up on what Tim mentioned on the National Heritage Library. Is there is the information somehow automatically extracted from some of the archives, or is there some workflows, or th or is it done manually? I'm not hugely, it's the Biodiversity Heritage Library, by the way, it's international, it's not. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, um, I'm not exactly sure of the workflows. I mean, obviously a lot of, a lot of the effort is on, is on um, scanning yeah. and digitizing um, the, the images of the, um, of, of the volumes themselves. And then there's a, an automated process of extracting the, um, the, you know, the text um, and particularly specializing in the species searches. Um, I'm, I'm not, over, not that familiar with the, uh, with the rest of the workflow. Thanks. Just a quick encouragement too, if you have nothing but the name of someone in, in, your, in, your, in your head that you think we should contact to uh, seek out additional historical sources, someone you know is knowledgeable on some historical source of biodiversity, we're interested in that too. So even if it's just a, just a name, um, put that in the spreadsheet, please. Or throw it out here. Um, it's hard to sort of throw out examples without knowing what you already have. Um, I'm assuming you have a lot more than the, just the couple examples that are listed. Um, and so like, you know, your mind automatically goes to things like Zooniverse where there are these interpretation programs running and I don't know if any of them are based in historical like work, but that would be a place to check. Um, and off like obviously like field guides, eBird, all of these huge like current um, uh, things or organizations have a historical component to them. Um, so I know eBird, there's the major uh, push to get historical checklists in and it's being done sort of all over the world through museums and like interested parties. Um, but I don't know if you've had those connections yet. No, not yet. Thank you. <laughs> birds, there's tons of historical information for birds, but it's in various um, states of interpretation. Okay, you might have this one, but U.S. Open Parks um, is an archive of digitized natural history collections from around 20 national parks in the U.S. Um, so, like, the one I'm familiar with is the Great Smoky Mountains. They've been digitizing their herbarium collections, um, as well as their, like, animal and vertebrate um, various other specimens they've collected, and then also um, uh, cultural uh, products, uh, cultural objects that they've collected throughout the park, throughout the history, um, and they're all freely available online. Thank you. Good. Could we put up both the tiny URL and the spreadsheet? Would that be possible? Um, yes, I was thinking also in the biological collections, for example, well, in, in Colombia, um, uh, we have like uh, centralized, uh, unique uh, registration for the collections. And I don't know, I, I think that they have specimens. For example, in Humboldt Institute, the collection have specimens from I don't know, 80, 90, for example, uh, they are um, specimens that uh, have a lot of historical value, I think. 
and and maybe if you have like these uh, connections with um, the, the this uh, centralized <laughs> institution that have all the registers of the collections, it could be a, a good contact because all of that information is already structured in in databases. So. Um, uh, many of them are, are publicly, uh, publicly on the web. Uh, some others are, are not there, but I think that could be a very good source of information as, as well. Thank you. Nestor? Thank you. No, uh, an important group of uh, uh, sources of information is also maps, uh, historical maps. Yeah. So I because uh, we are thinking only on species, but there are many uh, maps that were done mostly during the 19th century. Some even a little bit before. So, for example, there is a, we are right now analyzing for Northern Germany uh, uh, the map of the Prussian Empire, which contains information on forests, pit bogs. Uh, grasslands, agricultural areas, uh, urban areas at an extremely high detail. Mm -hmm. and, and those are very important also for, you know, delineating uh, habitats, but even you can use them inside models for, um, you know, assessing connectivity or even running um, uh, carbon accumulation models and that kind of stuff. So if people have in mind uh, those sources, that's also relevant. Yeah. I'm sure for France, I think there's a map that goes back to the, the 1700 old military maps, and it's being used to, to map forest extent uh, and, and roads, actually, historical roads. But yeah, thank you. Is this working? Oh, yeah, hello. Hi. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, about two weeks ago, there was in Montreal the Old Book Quebec, well, Old Book Society. I don't know exactly the name, but they do have a huge collection and super well categorized of all uh, like all the different types of books that they have. And I know they're very secretive about them because they're trying to sell them, and so it's very hard sometimes to get the information out of them. Um, but um, I know that back in Paris, I found those very old books about natural history of uh, Buffon of like the 16, 16, 69, I think it was. So um, maybe it's a good shot to contact those associations mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, they do hold all the old books that, they, that are not publicly available and might, maybe some will be actually interested in sharing. Um, yeah, a couple thoughts. I tried to find some papers, but I couldn't, so I'm just going to talk. Um, but uh, we talked about uh, indigenous knowledge, obviously, but there's like shell middens uh, are globally distributed sort of really old repositories of biological data. Um, I don't know if you already. And then one thing uh, I, I learned about a very cool, well, my, one of my friends did a very interesting study um, looking at halibut hook sizes, so looking at fishing gear and their change in size over time, because they're all size selective. And so I know that's not really maybe biodiversity, but it really is, you know. Yeah. Um, and then one thing that I was also thinking about is jewelry, uh, jewelry archives and museums, because um, jewelry often uses animal parts, but I don't really know how you'd go about doing that. Thank you. I didn't. Get I didn't get the name, the, the first source that you mentioned. Um, shell middens? Yeah. Uh, shell middens, shell mounds. Ah, um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's really cool. I, I never thought of that as a source here. Um, I'd be interested to see work done, I guess, doing the equivalent of coring in a midden to get a sense of changes through time of the composition um, of the shellfish. Yeah, and I think a lot of studies have been done more looking at human diet evolution or human, you know, ancient uh, habitation, but that data could easily be translated into, you know, diversity. Data. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, on that same kind of train of thought, uh, sawdust mounds as well. Um, I know there's been work done on that, but I don't have any 
direct references there now, but coring sawdust mounds to reconstruct uh, forestry activity. Thank you. So something else that can be looked at is sometimes old explorers would actually have journals which will include species distributions and one of my ancestors was an explorer, and so we were looking at some of the artifacts, and there were actual journals that showed where they are. In some cases, they will also have collected skins, etc., which may still be in museums. And then you can cross-reference exactly where they've collected things, where the abundances are, with any records that might be in existing museums. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a fantastic project, and one thing you may, was mentioned earlier, and I'm sure it'll come back in later in the afternoon, is, is traditional knowledge. A and in Canada, as we are going through reconciliation, there's been a lot of interviews, so it'll be oral material, probably hard and long process to extract, but there is at the Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, they have a ton of audio archives of stories from elders, and you might get some interesting information from those. And I want. I, I see that the table is uh, is actually filling. Uh, I didn't have it, so I'll look at it afterwards. Um, but yeah, we've talked a lot about um, species records and things like that. But as Nestor mentioned, uh, we can think of other uh, sources of information that will bring different type of biodiversity information sets, ecosystem extent, and everything. So I just wanted to to invite you to think a bit about other type of information that we can extract, um, like species traits, for instance. Uh, I know there's some work that was done with um, um, historical pictures of, uh, of um, fish uh, trophies, or I don't know how you, I, jet lag is making me forget my English, but basically you could see through time how the size of the fishes was uh, decreasing. Um, so anyway, just uh, opening this to, to different type of information that you could that you could also think of. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's a different type of information, but uh, and it's also in link with the um, indigenous people. So I saw some. Uh, people learning about um, biodiversity by reconnecting with their language mm -hmm. because within the language lies the, the knowledge of the species that are surrounding the native people and they also recognize within their culture uh, very important species that are, uh, that are embedded in some cultural practices. And so I guess it would need you know, would need to go to um, uh, indigenous people, but there's also um, I, I know like in Montreal there's an ethnobotanist that do that. It's not exactly that what he does, but there's also expert on that kind of information. I was just going to say something came to mind. I don't know if we talked about it, um, if we've talked about it uh, before, but, and I'm not sure if it actually falls uh, into the period of interest post mid Holocene, but cave paintings um, capture in some, sometimes pretty graphic detail um, certain species. Yeah, yeah there's, um, Picking up on the, on the fish photos, um, Daniel Pauli from the University of British Columbia, he actually did that studies with the photos of the um, fish size over, over generations. And the other thing that I thought of was, I know that um, Tim Hoffman from the University of Cape Town, he actually did a project where he um, 
took old photographs of landscapes and then actually um, went back to the sites and then took photographs again over a period of time to actually see how the landscape and the use of the landscape has actually changed. Yeah, if you have the reference, or that, that would be really good. Actually, this, I, I think that links nicely with the, the point that was made earlier on, on uh, how we can use citizen science in this. Um, there's a project I know in the, in, uh, that's led out of uh, a CSIC, Richer, uh, CSIC Richer Research Center, sorry, in the Pyrenees. And what they're doing is they found old photographs of protected areas throughout Spain, and now they invited uh, citizen scientists to go back to those sites and take the same picture so they can uh, compare. So um, th there, there's a lot of potential here as well. Yeah, thank you. I think we're actually approaching the 45 minute mark. Um, can we put the, the slide back? I want to make sure that we covered our questions. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to comment at all on, on existing standards to share those data? I don't know if this is information we can um, address now. This seems like a big can to open. Um, Tim? I think it was really just a, a question back to you and your, your team. There was this wonderful example uh, of the 16th century um, Spanish data set being published um, just as a, if you like, a normal GBIF occurrence data set with it's just a, um, the dates of the records were sort of 1583 which is absolutely great, using the, the, the Darwin Core standards. I think it would be interesting to know, having done that experience, which is still extremely unusual in GBIF to have um, the data set going back so, so far and we're on the kind of, with the sort of uh, um, source data that, or information that you were using, whether you felt that there was a need for the standards community to accommodate some differences when it comes to um, digitizing and, and sharing that kind of data because I think it would be mm. very useful and important maybe as part of this process to go back to biodiversity information standards and say well if we are really going to um, make best use of, of, of the potential of historical data then these are some of the, the, the terms or the, the changes that, that, that might be required. So it's actually not part of this effort I joined afterwards so I, can, I cannot really answer um, that specific question, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up to them. Yeah. I, I know that the, the, um, they had a lot of support from the, the GB Spanish node to help with uh, for formatting and standardization of the data. But yeah, I cannot tell you more. I'm just curious if when uploading species incidents data into GBIF that there's some way to include a measure of uncertainty for the, uh, the observation. Um, something you would almost necessarily, I think, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be honest about presenting historical data mm -hmm. in most of the formats we've discussed, you would have to include, right, um, some level of uncertainty about the, the, the time and the place um, of the observation. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can, for, for both of those time and place, you can, for example, you could just put a year or you could put a month or a year or put no date. <laughs> it's, there are some, some issues about, uh, yeah, we can't really show date ranges. Mm -hmm. um, and in, but in the case of, of location, you can, you can you could generalize location um, to, to whatever scale that you, um, of, of, of precision that you, you are comfortable using or put, put no um, Reference um, uh, that long on, but just a description of the locality. So there'd be ways of, of in a sense, expressing uncertainty just in, in how precise or not um, the, the data is, is, um, is published. Sorry, I think that's it. Yeah, I think. Okay. Is there any more? I, I see there was a comment in the back. Yeah, I don't know if it's fully formed in my head or if it's at all useful, but um, as a PhD student, I had nest cards. Um, and I know there's like nest card schemes um, available. 
uh, and there's a push to get you know old data digitized and put in because you don't get that level of granularity when you publish your thesis. Obviously, that's just the result. Um, and I, I know of researchers who have retired with reams of data sitting in their garages that have not been digitized um, and they're therefore completely unavailable. How you would get at that, I have no idea. Yeah. But I feel like it would be a pretty big source of raw information spanning, you know, as long as we've had universities. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, w w one of the participants of the workshop actually used to mention that quite a lot. It, I don't think he did during the workshop, but uh, yeah. Um, what's that, uh, how do you call those cards? Punch cards, is it? Yeah. Just US cards. US cards. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like punch cards, right, that you... Uh, uh, or it can, yeah. Ah, nest counts. Okay, sorry. I, 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 yeah, yeah, but, so yes, yeah. Yeah, on top of my head right now, like, I'm thinking of a perfect example, like, how to build network in, like, collating all the historical data. And what I'm thinking now is, like, there's, this is, like, a smaller group, but we have, like, the International Subterranean Biology Society, where in they made an effort of like assigning people from different countries to look for the museum specimens and monographs, like digitized monographs and also hard copy monograph from libraries. And then what we did is like, we just follow the usual spreadsheet that we're using for GBIF so that we can collect species name, locality. There's no coordinates, that's the first struggle. Like it's so hard to look for coordinates because some 1600 monographs has no coordinates, mm -hmm. but you have the locality. And then another problem is that some of the names for, for the places have been changed. Yeah. So it's so hard for us to track like the recent or like the actual name in the current time. Yeah, and then, but at the end, of, but at the, the output for that project is that we want to standardize all species distribution for all groundwater species all over the globe. It's an entire society's effort. And then put it in the web in a sh our shiny package that everyone can, can access so that they can see distribution of different species in groundwater. And then we just follow like the GB because we, we also want to upload the data in GB at the end of the day. But there's difficulty in terms of accuracy mm -hmm. and locality. But in terms of time, when the sample was collected, you can you can track like the time. Yeah. Can you remind? It, I didn't hear the name of the, the uh, it's society. It's the Subterranean Society. Sorry. Uh, International Sub Subterranean Biology. Subterranean. Thank you. But these are like smaller group for groundwater people. In the in the Spanish uh, geographical dictionaries, there's a similar problem with uh, with the localities. But sometimes they have the information say. Uh, this locality is south of something and west of something else, and they were able to kind of triangulate to find a new, uh, to confirm the location. But, yeah. can, I just, can I just come back on that, that particular point? Yes. Because I think this issue about um, including latitude and longitude, I mean, that, just, that doesn't just apply to um, uh, historical records. That's a, it's a standard issue of georeferencing where there isn't a lot long available, and there are, there's, there's a guide, there's, and there are various manuals on, on that, um, admittedly, you know, tending to, to relate to, to, to modern place names, but in, in a sense, I would, I would think it's really it's the, same, the same process. If you can get down to at least um, a, a, a range of, of where um, it's, you, the, the, the sort of um, roughly where the, um, uh, where the record, the historical record is, then you can you can you can real georeference so you can put that long, but just with 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 appropriate um, um, uncertainty. Yeah. So in that in that sense, I don't I don't think it's it, conceptually it's not really that different from a lot of digitization of specimen records from from the not so distant past. The International Subterranean Society is an amazing name. <laughs> Very cool. This 
song? Oh, yeah. I came in super late, so I don't know if this is relevant, but there's like a Canadian initiative called Living Data Project, which is like a, it like brings together graduate students across the country to do training in preserving data and like archiving data, but also they have these internships where they like, um, they digitize and archive a historical data set. Um, and it's pretty cool. I was part of it and my uh, lab mate did a thing where she was like geo-referencing uh, living data index, oh wait, what was it called? Yeah, living data index, no, living planet index. Uh, like, yeah, anyways, I don't know if you've talked about that, but it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Uh, Canadian Living Data Project, is that what you said? Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, that's, that's a lot to work with. Um, any more comments or input? Yes, Amanda. There, there seems to be a lot of work done here. Yeah. Already. We had a Spanish so, bias yeah. in, in Spain yeah, last true. time, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fair. It's fair. <laughs> yeah. There is an interesting project that I don't know if you heard about, and it's the Dataverse project, and it um, manage some kind of standard where all the credit and attribution for the data uh, and information is fully recognized. So it's about like have um, a data set uh, in, like you, you have a big data set, but you can have also a, a small data set inside of them. And um, it brings the possibility to, uh, I don't know, give uh, the correct credits, credits to the information and attribution. And, and, and it's, it's an interesting data um, as an alternative of the, uh, I don't know, the standards that we know, uh, like Darwin Core and that kind of, of standards. Uh, because we could include more information, like cultural information or socio-ecological information. Um, for example, right now at Humboldt Institute, we are managing this um, Dataverse project for um, ex extractor uh, socio-ecological data. Not only biological data with Darwin Core, but also socio-ecological data with this, um, this standard. It's called Dataverse Project, and I think it could be also an, an option uh, for this kind of, of, of databases. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing I just remembered is uh, something called the Siku Network. Um, so it's S-I-K-U. Uh, it's an indigenous knowledge social network. Um, and so there's an opt-in version, um, and you can, you know, release the data as you want to as an indigenous person. So the data sovereignty is sort of um, respected that way. Uh, but I think there is, and it's relatively new, um, but I think there's some work to um, backfill and to, to there's, there's room for stories, um, which could have some biodiversity information in it. Is that Canada specific? Yes. Okay. Another one for Canada. Another one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think we've hit the, the one hour mark, so maybe we can move on to the next, um, the next question. So we can use the same... Um, I don't know if you noticed, there's a three tabs in the, in the shared uh, Excel table. So can we go to the next slide? So we're moving away, now we focused a bit on, oh yeah, I'm sorry. 
There you go. I can do it. Okay. So, um, yeah, we spent the last hour discussing uh, what potential sources of information could be, but I think no matter how rich those historical material can, um, can be, we can all agree that any data cube that could be constructed from this would look a bit like this, so uh, very sparse data, especially um, um, taxonomically, for instance, and, uh, and temporally. So now if we want to move forward thinking, we, we have those um, data, and the long-term goal would be, can, can we um, produce EBVs? Can we populate a, a, a data cube like that? Um, can you think of successful uh, of example of successful integration of, of um, historical data, maybe not historical data, could also be just similar types of sparse uh, information coming from different sources and so on. And more generally, which approaches or methods or models do you think can be applied here to integrate diverse historical data sets uh, with all the limitations that, uh, that we've discussed? Just real quick, I didn't find this um, data cube like in immediately intuitive when I first was exposed to it. So just in case anyone uh, needs elaboration, you can imagine um, one axis on that. It, it represents the three-dimensional data. So you have one axis on there would be uh, time, one would be space, and then the third dimension would be entity. So it could be a species, uh, could be uh, ecosystem, uh, the various ways that we measure uh, biodiversity. Um, so, and you, and you can see that the, the idea here is that we have some coverage, right? Those blue, blue cubes within the big cube, but on all dimensions, that coverage is very, very sparse. So we're now, we're, we're sort of brainstorming ways now that we can take that limited information, those blue cubes, and extrapolate them as much as possible across the rest of the big data cube. Sorry, go ahead. I don't want to oversell paleo studies, but it's a really powerful tool. And I do a lot of paleo studies, like to rec reconstruct lake history. So what we usually do is that we collect sediment core. There's one group responsible for sequencing all possible DNA that you can get from the sediment core. So that gives you presence absence of species. So you have species record for the past 500 years, let's say. And then there's another group that's responsible for just the sediment chemistry. And the chemistry itself, it can give you an idea of like when algal bloom happened within the 500 years time frame, when microbial productivity is on its peak within the 500 years, and when there's possible oxygen depletion in the lake. So that's another group. And then the last group for the social component is that we also work with a lot of First Nation partners. So with that, we work with archaeologists. They collect uh, generational uh, stories about historical land use around the lake. Like, and then at the same time, there are some records of like natural history, like for example, natural induced landslide within the lake that can affect how the lake chemistry will change definitely. So by integrating those different uh, data, you can really re reconstruct like a more comprehensive story, which is helpful for like providing baseline data. Like for example, I work with uh, mining impacted areas. So we use the tool so that we can provide baseline data for the past 500 years and see how the diversity changed after they, st after they started anthropogenic activities within the area. So I think that's, that's a good example of mm -hmm. like historical data. Yeah, I think that's really helpful as a model for integrating a, a, a whole variety of really temporally distinct, you know, uh, data sets that are different in their focus. That's, that's really helpful. Can I ask um, at kind of what spatial scale you feel comfortable extrapolating the information you're pulling from cores and also from sort of local knowledge and other sources? Yeah, the disadvantage of this one is that you can do it like one lake system at a time. So you can only recreate like the story for this lake. And then for core, like uh, it's too much. The disadvantage is that you only collect one core, which is basically the deepest portion of the lake. So in terms of spatial data, I think that's the limitation. Mm. Thank you. Um, can you 
put um, the Excel table again, and now we go to, we can go to the second. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, already somebody filled it. Uh, if you wanna, so th this is way less detailed, but we're thinking if you uh, want to add some suggestions of uh, approaches or um, references and so on, uh, feel free to add them here uh, as well. Yeah, Amanda. It's just, yeah, sorry, can you put that out of the way? Can you put the um, slide with the tiny URL again? Sorry. The the one before. No, no, it's just uh, the the slide before. Sorry. Uh, no, you were uh, back to the to the yeah, and one slide. Oh, I can do it. Sorry, never mind. There you go. There. So to get at what integration might mean, um, I actually was going to ask you a follow-up question. I'm sure I don't know your name. Um, <laughs> um, I was going to ask. Um, in doing projects, so lake-specific projects, um, I imagine internal to your own working group, you've developed a kind of protocol for integrating those various data sources in a way that's you know, scientifically defensible and empirically robust. Um, do you know if broader standards exist for that kind of in, sort of multidisciplinary project in terms of integration? I think that's what we're trying to get at yeah. here. It, like, to be honest, like, if it's combining different data sets, that's where we are struggling. So in our internal protocol, since we have independent data collection, we just make sure that during the data collection process itself, we're not highly coordinating. Like we keep our data to ourselves because we don't want, we don't want it to be biased by the data like the other group. And then at the end of, we'll set just a certain time where we, we, we will all convene and then just collate all data and then we will just be surprised of whatever story we will be able to create. Because at first we tried that the traditional indigenous knowledge will present their data first, and it somehow affected how the other data, because there, there's personal biases. Once you know their story, it's so easy to twist the other data. Mm -hmm. So we just make sure that, let's just convene at the end once we all have this data, and then let's just recreate whatever we can and also, another comment maybe is like something that I learned is that use of careful use of some terms such as integration might have some personal conflict because when you say integrating, it appears that one knowledge stream is more ahead or more superior than the other. So for example, when we work with indigenous partners, I call them partners because we are equal and we are contributing on equal terms in terms of the, the project. So we, they prefer, like they somehow requested, like can we use braiding or weaving of this knowledge streams instead of like integration so that we feel equal whenever we are working in this project. And I think it creates like better harmony in terms of like combining all the data that we have. Um, lots of work right now on, on braiding and weaving knowledge systems and treating them as equal, not putting too much value on one knowledge system or another. So that's a, a great comment and, and there's so many references you can look to for that. I will say that when we were bringing together, looking at, again, different sources of documented indigenous knowledge, one thing we were trying to recognize was that different names are gonna be used in different regions. And so the same name for a particular fish might actually mean something different in different parts of the country. So the same name could mean two different species or you could have different names for one species. And so when we looked then to try to say, well, what does this information tell us about diversity? We had to be very careful about not really comparing sites, like not saying, oh, this one had this species, but it wasn't over here because it might have been. Mm -hmm. It might have just been under a different name. And it was less about sort of this one was more diverse than the other or this it was more sort of taking each set of information and treating it as its own parcel, saying, at this point in time, they said they had 20 fish species here. 
At this point in time over here, they say they had 30 fish species. And not trying to do those comparisons because you have to recognize the limitations of the data. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe this may be backtracking to the last section again, but I think something that I realized nobody, well, at least when I was here, we didn't really talk about, was uh, using fisher, fisher people. And I think that's something that we really often forget about because it's really, really hard to get open data from them but they're insane sources of biological knowledge. Even not even, not even just their fishing species, but like the fact that they spend probably the most amount of time out of any of us, at least on the open ocean. Um, but yeah, that's just something that I thought we should talk about. Great, I'd be really interested to hear more from those of you who have worked uh, with oral sources, uh, with sort of, um, narrative sources of biological data, how ultimately you do uh, walk, walk the fine line between respecting those sources as a important um, data source, uh, but also weighting them properly in your final conclusions. So, you know, how do you, how do you put the appropriate air bars around observations of an individual versus observations coming from other, other sources? Um, very big question, very difficult, but if anyone's sort of worked out some protocols in their own work, um, that would be an interesting contribution, I think, to this conversation. error bars around it, you're assigning a value to it. And you're saying, I think there's a chance you're wrong. And again, when working with indigenous communities, it's been very clear, that's not OK. That's not OK for you to do that. If, if, if they are providing information that you can use, you can't then turn around and say, well, that's not right. Or you know, I think there's some error there. And I think that's the challenge, is that you have to accept it at face value um, and try to uh, find a way to work with it in that way. We can't, we, this, and this is that idea of, we can't take our Western science view of how we treat data and apply it to, um, you know, people's observations and, and indigenous knowledge and other ways of knowing because error bars don't work in that case. It's not, we can't just mold it to how we would normally look at data that we collect. It's a, I don't have the answers there. It's a difficult, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a lot of debate right now. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. What do you do with contradictory information? So, right, if you're getting... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have the answer, unfortunately, about that, but it's true, you'll have those situations, and I think you're, oh, again, I don't know. I, <laughs> this is, I, I know so many people who are working actively with this right now and, and trying to tackle these questions, um, but I think you are still supposed to accept it and try and think, okay, well, what is... Where is this possibly coming from? Where does the contradiction possibly come from? And maybe there's a reason for that. And maybe it is something like, you know, different viewpoints viewing things slightly differently or using different names or something like that. And you kind of have to approach it again, accepting and saying, well, they're not wrong. It's just that from that knowledge standpoint, this is what species is there. And from this other knowledge standpoint, this is what we see. But I don't know. Yeah, it's really hard because <laughs> when, you, when you get into standardization, right? It, yeah. It's, it's going to be hard to fit some of the data into standard data protocols like those in GBIF and elsewhere. Exactly. You, right? Yeah. 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 This is part of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important in this kind of, of um, studies with, with people uh, not only to bring the, the questions that you want to work on but co-create with people the questions that are important for them. And that's a very, like, um, efficient, but also like, just <laughs> way to to approximate to the data, because it's not only to get there and given some forms to write the data that uh, we want to to take from there, uh, but um, to acknowledge that they have that knowledge in his power, and it's important to validate that knowledge and also to respond to the questions that they have about the, their environment. And I think that's a, a very good way to, 
to get in a place that you are a stranger, not them, <laughs> and, and start to ask, ask them what are their questions and how the data that they need, uh, we can also help to provide uh, that, that knowledge. Are you citing oral sources as co-authors in publications? I think that is at least <laughs> the, the least that we can do also. Uh, like, they, they made part of the process, the scientific process as well, not as a, as a scientist, because it, there are no scientists, but um, uh, as, uh, as he said, as an equal. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that. So if you go to a place, the least you can do is if you uh, produce uh, papers or books or information to give the attribution correctly to, to, to that community or, 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 or the people that uh, interact with you. Thank you. Can you pass the microphone just behind you? Thank you. How do we, uh, you know, interpret historical anecdotes and uh, historical accounts? Um, do do we take into account? I mean, the fact that it's not it's not static information. You know, oral traditions change over time, and uh, you know, none. I mean. You know, how do we account that when we compare it to, you know, uh, Western knowledge, for example? You know, accounting that well, the, the story that's being told today might have been slightly different if it would have been told 200 years ago, for example. Hmm. Apologies there. <laughs> my, my train of thought was just spinning there. but. <laughs> yeah. Going back to your question of, like, how do you deal with if, like when the data is like highly contradicting. Yeah, I, I totally agree with the, the response earlier that you're not in the right position to judge whether it's true or incorrect. The best thing that we can, like, I think the best learning that I got from like working with uh, First Nation communities is that I should, I learned how to set aside my own agenda. I'm coming from the academic perspective, set aside your agenda of like publishing papers. Because at the end of the day, you're just doing this to document their own truth. So if it's highly contradicting at the end of the day, the best thing that you can do is to document all the data that you collected and then put it in a report and make sure that you'll send it to the entire community. So if there's high contradiction, it's hard to publish, yes you won't be, there's, there's a high chance that you won't be able to publish anything, but just make sure that all the reports are properly documented and it goes to the right community that owns the actual data. So I think that that's the best scenario that you can get if your data are highly contradicted. So thanks again for all this input. I'm trying my best to take uh, notes. I, I hope I'm covering everything. Um, I just want to uh, come back to those questions very quickly, understanding that I, I, I don't expect that we'll have a, a, a concrete answer um, by, by the end of uh, today. But yeah, again, to invite you to um, add to the table, for example, if you have um, references or examples of um, of uh, successful um, um, exercises or different types of data, uh, historical data were brought uh, together. Um, and also if you have approaches or, or models uh, that you would wanna suggest. Um, yeah, still happy to, to hear your thoughts about that. But if there's no pressing comment right now, I think we can move to the last part, which is where do we go next with that? I know that I'll have to digest a lot of the information uh, that you've provided, but I know I'm going to continue working on this for sure, but my question to you here at this conference is uh, if there's more uh, people that are interested in continuing this discussion. Um, and actually at the 
2016 uh, Geobon conference that was organized in Leipzig. I, I participated in a, a similar session that was organized by, uh, uh, by Miguel Clavero, who is one of the co-organizers of today's session. And towards the end, we were discussing if we wanted to establish uh, something that would be uh, similar to a, a past biodiversity observation network within Geobon. Um, I'm not suggesting we do that tomorrow or even next year, but maybe we can replant that seed and see if there's there's some uh, people interested and we can also uh, take it from there. So yeah, uh, this is a, an open uh, discussion that we can have until the end of the session. Uh, but just so you know, so again, in this shared um, spreadsheet, the last tab is for you to put your uh, contact information if you want uh, to me to reach out to you afterwards. And one thing I'm gonna do is that we're gonna add also our contact at the top of this uh, table if you wanna uh, copy them now and, and reach out to us as well. So I'll just open the floor to get your thoughts on this. I think I had one comment there and then in the back, yeah. Someone may have already um said this while I stepped out to go to the bathroom, so sorry if this is a repeat. Um, but one thing I, th I think is important to think about is like in terms of um, like standards and criteria for data, it's like what is the exact like question or area of research that it's trying to be applied to? Like if you're trying to like reconstruct a past species distribution, um, in that case you'd probably want something like, um, like a paleo record or um, um, like like trapping records or something that is collected like more, or, or some type of historical data like a trapping record that is collected in a more standardized um, and like higher spatial resolution way um, versus other types of data might be more suited to like other questions. But um, yeah, so if, so yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I would have put this in the spreadsheet, but my laptop died. Um, I was just thinking of data integration, and this isn't um, to do with historical, but current work. And so the boreal, let's see, it's BAM, boreal avian modeling, no, yes, project um, that's happening across boreal Canada uh, has done a tremendous amount of work on documenting their integration process. So there's a suite of papers out there um, that describes like how they did the data cleaning, what what did they do to bring uh, like you know tens of different sources that were all built differently to monitor um, birds in this case. Uh, so it's very well documented. So maybe that would be useful yeah. to to look up. Um, but I would say that if if a, a bond gets off the ground or some sort of centralized database, I think it would be heavily used um, because uh, just to feed into policy because we continually get questions of like, okay, well, why does it start in 1970? And we know how degraded everything was already by then. And so there's, there's real power in being able to go backwards. So I'm fully supportive. <laughs> One. In the boreal bird um, in data integration example, did they did they integrate historical observations as well? So there was a range of dates included. I don't know how far back in time okay. they went, um, but they were mostly focused on climate change. So they were thinking sort of future, but they did do a ton of integration of different sort di different data sets. So I thought there might be some parallels. Um, yes. Um, I guess thinking about the previous question about integration, there was not a lot of um, enthusiasm, I think, about integrating because it's, it's hard and data are scattered, diverse, uh, uh, and it's worse with historical data than with the data we have. So I think if there is a, a past biodiversity observation net network. It should be more about documenting um, the data source than the actual data. So more, more about the metadata than about the data itself. So if 
somebody has an interest in, let's say, fish, they can go and type in fish and see where are these records, I mean, in yeah. general, and then they could, they could go there and deep dive, you know. So that would be, I, I've tried to do this for just plants and it was just a nightmare. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's my gut feeling, okay. let's say. So you're thinking, for instance, I choose a taxa, a time frame and a place and it could tell me where the information would be. I think so. I, I guess also I'm thinking about, I'm, uh, so I feel like, uh, so I'm not a, a biodiversity scientist, but I'm more a limnologist and in the network I'm in, they do this for all the studies that uh, went out of the, our group. They just, you know, tag where was the study done, uh, what is the time frame, and, and then basic taxa. So we can sort of know what's the information there. And eventually you can do a kind of a map of, of things, and which would probably be your cube, you know, lot long in time. And then, then you have some information. Yeah. And then there's, yeah, link with DOI and stuff and yeah. whatever information you, you can find. Or if it's a library, because a lot of the data are just like in r reports and some sort of agency or our old book or a uh, living person, so. I mean, I think you're getting at what the kind of fantasy is ultimately, right? Is some very ser easily searchable, uh, one-stop shop database, meta huge database, right, where you can, with your particular interest, go in and use in in intuitive search terms to pull all available contemporary and historical data sources um, uh, for a geographic region, for a particular species, uh, et cetera. Um, I mean, people are working on those those projects or some proto you know, projects that are moving in that direction. But I mean, I, ha I have to, I, at least me, for example, when I start to think about this and we're, we're in wish list mode and we're blue skying, you know, that's like the, that's the direction is all these integrated into a single searchable platform um, and not siloed in the, in the way that they tend to be, you know, currently for specific subspecialties in specific regions. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, aren't, you know, like the Smithsonian or all these um, like huge archival institutions, don't they already have systems in place that kind of do that, obviously for their own records, but like couldn't those same systems be co-opted on a, on a larger or a, a more global scale? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, I think choosing from the existing integration protocols that have already been developed is, is is the most logical step forward, right? You, you wouldn't want to reinvent the wheel. I think that's totally right. Um, the big question would be which, um, yeah. But it's a good point, yeah, worth looking into. Hi, um, my name is Siddharth, and uh, uh, my question, uh, it's not a question, basically, uh, I'm a remote sensing scientist, so uh, whenever we talk about any data set, we talk about like credit data set. So a very, very good example that uh, one of the data set from like uh, climate parameters, where we have like temperature, precipitation, all the other different type of uh, reanalysis data now it is available for like many years of uh, uh, if you if you combine the past uh, network also so it is available at google earth engine now so the users can now across the globe can use that data set for their analysis and it is very very, very useful i think something similar uh, can be achievable uh, if we can include some sort of uh, uh, biodiversity related data set at the google earth engine platform some sort of collaboration if it is possible then it would be a great help for the like community who are you know try to integrate the in-situ observations and the uh, remote sensing observations. 
So that is my uh, suggestion. If it is possible in the coming future, maybe some some people may be working also in these directions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can you repeat yeah. the name of the 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 project? I so didn't catch. So it's it. a Google Earth Engine platform. Oh, Google Earth Engine. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So like gridded data yes. set, like if it is available for the users, uh, free of cost, open source. Yeah. So that would be a great help for the like uh, entire scientific community. Like just one example, like previously uh, I was doing some analysis that how the uh, uh, remote sensing based indices like NDVI can be relatable with the uh, movements of the, uh, the migration of the different word species in, in the Canada. So the data set was not available at Google Earth Engine platform, but at some other platforms. And then I try to bring on that platform. So that could be one of the example that I would like to quote here. Mm. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for that. I think it's entirely possible that uh, Google Earth Engine itself becomes uh, a go-to uh, for the type of information we're, we're describing here, historical sources, once, once they are digitized. I mean, the, the platform is just so streamlined in, in terms of uh, finding, um, processing, and then analyzing all, all this data in you know, an extremely efficient, computationally efficient, user-friendly way. So there's a good chance, I think, that that's where we're moving anyway. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. But one note on that, it's, it's, and it, it's not that I disagree, but one reason why we had also the, the question about um, existing repositories or databases where the data can be mobilized is that I wouldn't want to reinvent something. And so in the case, for instance, of the geographical dictionaries in Spain, what the data could be mobilized into GB if that was perfect. There was no need to, um, to think about a different structure or a different uh, home for this data. So I think it's also important whenever possible to think how we can standardize all this information and make it available in existing uh, uh, structures. Just a thought on kind of uh, like the org chart of um, Geobond, and, and you, you, you know, we're talking about where we, whether you would want to establish a past biodiversity observation network, and maybe this is part of your vision, but it seemed that, that you would want to establish such a network uh, within each existing bond, correct, that is geographically bounded, um, and not a separate entity that is without a geographic bound, is kind of global, right? Right, so it would be, yeah, trans, um, it would go across the different, so more of a thematic bond, bond okay. than, a, than a geographical one, because, yeah, obviously also the marine bond, freshwater bond could fit into this, and the national and, and regional one as well. Um, so, yeah, that would be cross-cutting entity. Uh, you do imagine yeah. a single uh, kind of entity that, that crosses all existing bonds? That could feed bonds. from, okay. yeah, yeah, or, okay. yeah collaborate with um, very embryonic thought, yeah. as you can see. But the question is also whether there's interest to go in this direction eventually. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just open it up. So um, the middle question up there, so is there interest in continuing this discussion and what form, what do we imagine this discussion taking place in? Um, if anyone has any ideas, feel, you know, feel free to, to discuss. So yeah, one thing, actually, the, the big uh, funding word that did it came up, um, but yesterday we were discussing if, if um, it was worth thinking of, uh, of applying for um, networking activities and things like that, N which is also why we're asking uh, who's interested in continuing this discussion so that uh, if opportunity arises, we can also um, co-design a project together to, to, to continue this. So this, this is also, yeah, maybe the, these words should have been <laughs> on the slides, but this is also where, where we were going. Um, so the question also, if, if you can think of um, funding schemes that could apply to the kind of, dis moving forward, the discussion that we've had today, that, that would also be interesting. 
have had synthesis centers uh, in mind, for instance, as an example, but that's just one, one way of, of uh, thinking about, about funding this. Yeah, just, I just want to share like how we somehow started with the groundwater documentation. We somehow started by doing a case study because it's so hard like to cover all groundwater species. So we somehow just pick, let's start with one species that's all over the globe and then ask people who are willing to upload those digitized resources into one repository that's one, and then if it's not yet digitized, ask people if they are willing to scan these resources and then upload it. Mm. So it's easy, it, that's the easy part. The next part is like, how do we extract this information from the digital resources? Because you need to manually check each record. But at the same time, since we're only focusing in one species, we were able to have a workflow how to digitize resources how, where to upload those resources. And then we were able, I think the most important part is like we were able to standardize like a simple Excel spreadsheet to identify which information do we need for the end output. So at least like you know, we, we can start by like navigating how to standardize the workflow and identifying what kind of data do we need for this end output that we want for this project. Because it's so hard if you'll start with like all freshwater species, all marine species, so it's too big. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, still taking notes. Yeah, I like the idea of mobilizing people around a really concrete, um, narrow, uh, you know, straightforward idea. Um, to work out the kinks in the process and use it as a foundation for further development. Um, yeah, a big part of this is kind of getting to the communities that access this information on a regular basis and mobilizing them, convincing them that it's worth extracting the information that we need, the biodiversity related information, and putting it in a format that we can access it um, and you know, ultimately building the bridge between them and us. I'm thinking of historians just in particular who have their own workflows and their own conferences, and um, uh, I like your idea, basically, of kind of trying to, uh, trying to mobilize that community in some way that is fun, that speaks to them, and that gets the process started of moving this information from documents, in the case of historians primarily, to databases in which natural scientists can take advantage of it. zero minutes left on the big clock here. I don't know if that means we, there's still a bit of time until coffee, but we've also had a very um, rich and fruitful discussion. I know I, I learned a lot, took a lot of notes, and I see that we also had a lot of input from you on the, on the shared table. Um, if there's any, yeah, ah, I see there's a comment there or question. You mentioned historians, uh, that's obviously a natural partnership, uh, but as we talked a lot about um, knowledge that's present in different communities, and particularly I'm thinking indigenous communities, I think around the table, there should be partnerships with indigenous people, because not only do they have the knowledge, but they also have the bad experience of knowledge taken from them, and if, if, it's, if it's a true partnership, um, and I wish I would, quote you better because you use a good word in your sentence, but of, of having a product that speaks to them and speaks to their needs today, um, I think that project could go a really long way as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe this kind of which is, or how can the data be used, or maybe even relating to funding and stuff. Um, 
so I work in wetland restoration with Ducks Unlimited. <laughs> and um, so we try to restore wetlands where they were historically present. And I know we have a map that we keep popping up, a really old map from 1800s and so. And we really see what used to be like the St. Lawrence River and where it might have been the wetlands before and stuff. So there would better definitely be use of like identifying this could be helpful for restoration projects afterwards where species used to be, where the habitat used to be, and then moving towards the action part of using these data. So. I think highlighting those real actionable um, uses, right? I mean, the highlighting in your reach out campaigns to the various communities from which information could flow, um, some of the some of the use cases like that uh, is really important, right? Because that that mobilizes people, that gets people interested. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also was thinking, like, obviously through our discussion, we realize like all of our work is very interdisciplinary, obviously. Um, but I wonder, you know, I feel like this would be a really amazing project for someone in archival sciences. Like I wonder, you know, if you go through that path, like rather than finding funding for the project or maybe in addition for finding funding to the project, but you know, you're both in academic institutions, maybe going through a pathway like that. Interesting, you mean like like library science programs? Like, yeah? Cool, yeah, good idea. Yeah. Noted. Yeah, I feel like finding people who like want to spend time going through a lot of old stuff, you know, <laughs> that's gonna help. Other, th other than the grad students who are forced to do it, yeah. yeah. to build on what you just said, which I think is awesome, um, is if there's a way, and this would obviously be longer term and come from a more organized entity, um, but to get into school curriculum and to have like projects where higher level, like I'm saying like university or in Quebec here, we have CIGEP, um, students would have tasks assigned to them and it would be the digitization and you know, maybe cleaning or whatever, according to standards, to get some of this information in, because it's one thing to identify, which I like, there's so much information out there already, but then to get it into a format that can actually be used um, is a whole other thing. So that would sort of be one avenue. And then to build on what David was just saying, um, reconciliation is really important here in Canada, um, and so, one funding lever that would also be really good for reconciliation is to have a pilot that's focused on reconnecting um, Indigenous peoples with their ancestral knowledge um, in a way that can, you know, uh, reconnect the youth um, and uh, also plug into um, and support the Indigenous Guardians Network and the biodiversity network sort of in general, um, I think that could have legs. Yeah, thanks, cool ideas. I like the sort of citizen science in the classroom idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, thank you for the suggestions. Keep your ideas coming. I can. I'm still taking notes. So, is this working? Oh. Just a suggestion: if you wanted to like pilot like the citizen science approach, um, the website um, Zooniverse. Yeah. Yeah, that would that would probably be a good place to yeah. start. Yeah. I've done a few of those, and they're very fun. last minute comments, questions, suggestions. Nope, once, twice. OK, 
Okay. So I think, yeah, I can speak for both of, both of us to, to uh, again, thank you for a, a very rich uh, discussion. Um, and yeah, we, we have a, a lot of material to work with, uh, some context of people that we can come back to uh, afterwards. Um, we're both gonna stick around until the end of the conference also, so if something comes up afterwards, just, yeah, come to us uh, anytime. So I've added our my contact, I'm just missing Adam's email address here uh, in the um, in the Excel spreadsheet, but uh, yeah, again, um, we're around, so so yeah, just come anytime uh, to continue this this uh, great discussion. And so yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we can close it. Do you want to say something? Uh, I'll just echo what Leticia said. Thank you for lending us your minds for this hour and a half, um, and uh, very open to discussing with all of you, you know, for the rest of the conference and after um, your ideas. So thank you.